In his book, The Blue Parakeet, Scott McKnight tells the story of how, as a college professor, each semester he would offer his students a test that would walk them through a series of personality questions, but they'd have to answer it about Jesus. So they'd answer questions like, what was he like? Was he talkative? Was he the life of the party, more low-key? Was he an introvert or an extrovert? Then the middle section of the survey of the test would be just background information on the students. And then they would have to answer those same personality questions, but this time about themselves. And over the years of doing that, what he found was the students frequently imagined Jesus to be an awful lot like them. You see, sometimes our understanding of who Jesus is and how he thinks can be shaped a lot more by our own perspective and our own beliefs than what we see in the Bible. But we want to have an accurate picture of who Jesus is. So for the next several weeks, we're going to be looking through at several different statements that Jesus makes, explaining who he is and what he's all about. You see, in the book of John, Jesus offers his disciples seven statements about himself, seven explanations of who he is and what he's up to. And they would have resonated with his followers because they draw heavily from the Old Testament scriptures, from images and ideas that his followers would have known very well. So go ahead, if you have your Bibles close by, go ahead and turn to John chapter 6. See, one day, a huge crowd followed Jesus out to a remote place to hear him teach. And the day grew late, and the people didn't have any food. And so Jesus took the lunch of a small boy, five pieces of bread and two small fish, and he broke them and he multiplied them to feed the whole crowd, over 5,000 men, women, and children that were there that day. Jesus provided for them abundantly. But then he dismissed the crowd, told them to go back home, and then he told his disciples to go get into a boat and cross to the village on the other side of the lake. Jesus himself stayed where he was and spent the evening praying. Later that night, he decided to go catch up with his disciples, but he walked out to them on the water. You remember that story. We got into the boat, and then they continued on and arrived at the village the next day. And where we pick up in the story is where the people of the crowd, the people who'd gone to hear Jesus teach and had been fed the, the bread and the fish, they run into Jesus there in the village the next day. And that's what we see starting in verse 25. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. So Jesus ignores their question about when he got there, and instead he calls them out a bit. He says, you know, you're looking for me not because of anything that I said, but you got so excited about the free food. And when you did, you missed what the bread and the fish were pointing to. Now, I don't think Jesus is particularly bothered that they're seeking after him for a superficial reason. Sometimes it's simple and superficial things that lead us to Jesus. You know, I had a friend who, when he was a teenager... He went to church for the first time just to meet girls. But while he was there, he heard about Christ, and he put his trust in Jesus, and it changed his whole life. It was something superficial that led him to Jesus, but when he met Jesus, it changed everything for him. You know, for many of us, we come to Jesus sometimes with superficial reasons, superficial reasons for looking for him. We need help with a decision. We need wisdom. We're searching for peace in our lives or just feels like something's missing. And so we go and turn to Jesus. Maybe he'll have the answer. I don't think it's a problem if we don't always seek after him for some deep, profound motive. Sometimes it's just those superficial things that drive us to him. But what Jesus seems to be saying here is, whatever drives you here, don't let that crowd out that I offer a lot more. Don't just be blinded by the superficial stuff, but let that draw you to Jesus 
And then you realize that he offers something far deeper than what we were searching for in the beginning. Jesus said, the bread and the fish that you saw, they were just a sign to point you to something more, that I offer you true life. You know, the difference between what the crowd is looking for and what Jesus is offering them is kind of like comparing fast food to a family meal. The crowd's coming to Jesus saying, you know, we have a need. Can we get something to fill our empty spot so that we can continue and run about our life and do our thing? And then if we get, you know, hungry, if we have an empty spot again, we know where to come back to. And Jesus is saying, you know, I have something to fill you. But what I have to offer you, it's not just, it's not just something to fill your empty spot. It's not just something that's going to keep you going for a day or so. What I offer you is to sit down and to enjoy time around the table with me and to take in something that won't just, it won't just feed your bodies, it'll feed your souls. Jesus is offering them far more than what they're seeking after. The crowd hears him say that, and they think, okay, if Jesus has some special end with God, if he's figured this thing out, if he has the secrets to the spiritual life, then let's hear what they are. And so that's what they ask him in verse 28. They say, what, what must we do to do the work God requires? A lot of times in their day in, in Judaism, there were different groups, different teachers that would say, you know, there's, there's some special sauce, some secrets to following God. There's some secrets to the spiritual life that you need to know. And so these different teachers or different groups would have recommendations for the right way to follow after God. They would say, you want to be Jewish, sure, but there's a right way to be Jewish. And so you need to follow these practices. You need to fast, and you need to give to the poor, and you need to join the right group. And so the crowd is asking Jesus, all right, what's your recommendation? We know all the other teachers and their recommendations, how to follow after the, the spiritual life. What's your way? And this is what Jesus says in verse 29. The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Nothing more. Jesus doesn't offer them a whole list of to-dos or a recommendation for the secret way of following in Jesus kind of methods. Instead, he just says, the only thing that it matters is believe in me. Follow me. I'll show you the way. Now, this is a bold statement because it's different than what they've heard everybody else say. And so when Jesus says that, they answer him. Verse 30, okay, what sign then will you give that we can see it and believe you? What will you do? You know, our, our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. They're saying, okay, Jesus, if you want us to be all in for following you, if you want us to sign a blank check and go carte blanche and just be 100% sold out and in your corner, then we're going to need a good reason for doing so. And when we read this, right after he's fed the 5,000, it's like, dude, seriously? Wasn't that enough? Don't you have enough evidence to follow after Jesus at this point? But here's why they say that. You see, this crowd, they remember their history. They remember back 1,500 years earlier when their forefathers were enslaved in Egypt. And God rescued them. God raised up Moses to lead them out from slavery. And then as they wandered on their way to the promised land, the land that God had promised them, God provided for their needs each day. He sent manna down from heaven. You remember manna, it means what is it? It was that weird kind of uh, flaky bread-like stuff. The people had to go and gather it each day, six days a week. And they did that for 40 years. For those 40 years, God provided for them as they wandered along. And many of the Jewish people now, now that we've fast-forwarded 1,500 years, they're under Roman oppression, and they're remembering how God had answered in their past, and they're anticipating that God's going to rescue them again. They believe that a rescuer is coming, and many of them think, 
that when that time finally comes, when the rescuer comes, it's going to usher in a golden age for Israel, a golden age for the Jewish people where God provides for them once again. And they're thinking, if Jesus is this rescuer they've been waiting for, then a real good sign that he is who they're waiting for is if they're provided for every day. Not just a one-hit wonder sort of thing like they've just seen. They're looking for a daily provision from God. And so that's what they're asking. They're saying, Jesus, are you the new Moses? If so, if you're the one who's going to usher in this golden age, if you're the rescuer we've been waiting on, then show us by providing for our needs each day, just like God did before. That's what would take. That's what it would take for us to be fully committed to following after you. But Jesus has to correct their expectations a bit. Verse 32, Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Jesus tells them, don't get caught up on what Moses did and what happened back then. The manna that came down from heaven back then, the manna that God provided, it was from the Father. Moses was the leader, but God was the provider. And God's still the provider, Jesus is saying. So don't get caught up looking on, at things to be just like they were with Moses. Don't expect it to be kind of a, you know, a reboot of what Moses had done before. Instead, look for what God is doing. And Jesus is saying, right now, in this moment, God is still providing for you. God is providing something even better than what he did before. And the people hear that, and they're like, cool, we'll take it. Verse 34, they say, sir, always give us this bread, this true bread from heaven you're talking about. And then this is what Jesus says. Verse 35, he declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus said, you're looking for God to provide like he did back then. But you don't understand that I am God's ultimate provision. I am the one that you've been waiting for. I'm like the manna, but better. You see, back then, you know, God provided, and that was great. But you had to go and gather it each day. That sustained your physical life for but a day. Jesus is saying, I'm here as God's provision for more than just your physical life. I'm here to offer you eternal life. And life, not just eternal life as in everlasting. Eternal life is more than just the duration of it. It's about quantity, but also quality. Jesus is saying, I came that you can have life that lasts, and life that's full, and life that's abundant, life that's rich. Life as God meant for it to be. That's what I come to offer you now. And Jesus is telling the crowd this is what it is. This is what you are looking for. I am the bread of life. I am the one that you've been longing for. I am God's ultimate provision that all of this was pointing to all along. But the crowd has a hard time accepting that. You see, sometimes it's possible for us to recognize our longings and still not understand what it is that we're longing for. We know from the world of dietitians that sometimes, a lot of times, when we're going about our day and we start to feel hungry, our body doesn't actually need food. It needs water. You see, the internal signals in our body, when we start to get on the borderline of dehydrated, they mirror, they're, they're almost exactly the same as when our bodies are thirsty. And so you can be going about your day and your stomach starts to growl and you can pass over that bottle of water and reach for a hamburger and be passing up on the very thing that your body needs most. And in the same way, the crowd is doing that. They're still looking for God's provision while they're looking in the very face 
of God's ultimate provision. They're still caught looking for food, looking for what they need for a moment. And Jesus is the one who will ultimately satisfy their need. And you know, for us, as followers of Christ, we can fall into that trap too. Because sometimes, even as followers of Christ, even after we put our trust in Him, sometimes we start looking around for something else to satisfy us, something else to fulfill us, something else to complete us and to give us life. We come to Jesus and we say, okay, we've gotten forgiveness, we've received that, now let's look for significance somewhere else. We've received eternal life, or we have the promise of a future, but now let's go about and try to satisfy our souls here and what we see all around us. And we don't, we don't realize that Jesus is the one who satisfies all of our needs. You know, we, we long for significance sometimes. And we don't realize that significance is found in our identity as followers of Christ. That's what gives us significance, who we are as his people. Sometimes we look for something that lasts, uh, you know, something to, to live for, a cause. And we don't understand that what Jesus has done, he's given us a mission of eternal value. We look for, for clarity. We look for an identity. We don't understand that the one thing that matters most about us is who we are as a son or daughter of God. Jesus is the one who satisfies our deepest longings. He is the bread of life. He is the one that satisfies our needs in the deepest of ways. And so, church family, let's not look anywhere else. Let's not try to be satisfied or find satisfaction turning anywhere else. But let's fix our eyes on Jesus alone because he's the one who truly satisfies us. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for sending Jesus to satisfy our souls, to meet our deepest needs. You meet our physical needs. You provide for us. But you provide in so much deeper ways than we even realize at times. And so, Lord, teach us to turn to you. Teach us to turn to you to find our satisfaction, to find the fulfillment that we need, the completion that our souls long for. And show us how to rest in who, who you are and who you've created us to be. Father, I pray that you would guide us all as we go on from here. Guide us so that we can be faithful in following after you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.